This conference will now be recorded. Let us pray. Dear Lord, dear Lord, we praise your holy name and we lift up the spoken and the unspoken prayer requests that you, you have just brought to us on our path, knowing you are able to bring good out of even the most challenging issues that we face for healing, for comfort, Forgiveness, salvation, provision, wisdom, guidance, direction, and protection in our lives. Lord, when we are brought low, either by our own prideful and sinful ways, at the hand of someone else, or simply because of the fallen nature of the world we live in, we have eternal hope in your promised new covenant. We are thankful to you that we can study the dreams that Daniel interpreted, alongside the inspired words of the Apostle John. We can take comfort in God's living and active word, an open line of prayer and presence, and his son living in us. Holy Spirit living in us. What a hope we have despite our rebellious nature. Help us to yield to and cooperate with your Holy Spirit every day to accomplish your kingdom purposes in our lives and to make us more like Jesus, Amiti Ha Olam, the light of the world in this very dark world. We lift up our country, Father. We ask that crucial uh, ruler leaders in our country are saved and totally turn around uh, as a result of your transformative power in our lives. Open our hearts and our minds to your perfect word now and help us to apply it to our lives you, through the Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, amen. Amen. Okay, and uh, if you're following along, we are in the book of Psalms, and we'll begin this uh, study in chapter 60, 6 zero. And this particular psalm was written during a period of time when David was king of Israel. It was a time in Israel's history where they had a rapid expansion in their military power. Uh, they were experiencing victories um, over their enemies. And if you are a child of God and experiencing great successes and great victories in your life, uh, this too can be a time uh, of, of danger. Um, and there's no, there's no time in your life that's more dangerous as during the times that you have great victories and great successes. When you're riding high on a success in your life, our human nature would have the tendency to have us think that the reason why things are going so well uh, is because of me. It's because of how great I am and how talented I am and how dedicated I am. And it's because I am such a spiritual person. You see, that's human nature. That's what human nature would have us think. These are the thoughts that would go through our minds. And so the reason why uh, I'm, I'm being so blessed in my life uh, is because I'm such a wonderful person. Well, that's... That's not exactly the reason why, you see, because even though you can believe your own press on how great you think you are, uh, the, the reason why things are so well in your life and so blessed has to do with your relationship with God. Now, David, during this period of time, when things were going very well for him and very well for his kingdom and very well for the nation, uh, David and a bunch of his troops were in the northern region of Israel. Uh, his troops were battling the Syrians. And as they're battling, uh, David receives a message uh, that the Edomites have taken advantage of David's absence and of a big part of David's army being absent because they were in a different section of the country. Uh, and they have attacked Israel in the southern re region. So the Edomites were attacking Israel on the south side. And so 
uh, David, King David orders Joab to take part uh, of, of the army of Israel and go back into the south part near Jerusalem and take on the Edomites. And Joab experiences a very hard fought battle, but he prevails over the Edomites. Um, and David understood that defeat on the battlefield was always a reflection of what was going on in Israel's relationship with God. Long before um, they would be defeated by the enemy, they have been defeated spiritually. Whatever's going on uh, with their enemy was a reflection of where they were in their relationship with God. And at this moment in history, the enemy seems to have an upper hand over Israel before David dispatches Joab down to the southern part of Israel uh, to fight the Edomites. Um, and so before David hears back as to what the results are, after he dispatches troops, with, with uh, Joab to, this, to go back to the south, David writes this psalm. Uh, and so he doesn't know what the outcome is yet with uh, Joab and the army against the Edomites. All right, so that gives you a little bit of history of what happened uh, that led David to uh, sit down and to pen uh, this psalm that we refer to as Psalm chapter 60. So let's uh, let's begin um, let's begin with uh, Arnie. Arnie, would you unmute please and read verses one through four, nice and loud. God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry, oh, restore us. You have made the land quake, you have torn it open, Repair its breaches for its totters, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. From the bow. All right, so success is something which has spoiled a lot of people. Uh, notice all the pronouns. Uh, that David is using as he's referring to God. Uh, all personal pronouns referring to God, David realizes that Israel has had a great deal of success because of who God is, not because of who David is, but because of who God is. <clears throat> and it's not about David, it's not about talent, uh, David's talents, but rather it's all about God. And at this moment in history, David has been blindsided, uh, and he's wondering why. Why have I been blindsided? Okay, let's take a look at some more verses. Uh, Linda, would you unmute and read verses 5 through 8, please? Save us and help us with your right hand, that those you love may be delivered. God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph, I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet, Judah my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I toss my sandal. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Philistia. Thank you. So these are all things which God has said. These are all promises that were given from God to David. <clears throat> These are the things God actually spoke to David in his heart. And God kept those promises to David. Now you think, just for a moment, you stop and think about the promises that God has given to you and who and he's given to me. God has told all of us, I'm going to give you peace in the middle of a storm. I'm going to meet all of your needs. God told us, my presence will always be with you until when? Until the ends of the earth. God has given you and me an amazing amount, a tremendous amount of promises. 
if we find ourselves <clears throat> in our life where we cannot enjoy God's promises, there's only two possibilities of why we cannot enjoy God's promises. Number one would be if God were a liar, we know that not to be true. Or number two, we ourselves have some problems. And David is saying, I know that this is what God has promised, but we're not experiencing that right now. So apparently the problem is not with God, but it's with me. The problem is with the people of the nation of Israel. All right, uh, Carrie Crawford, would you read verses nine through 12, nice and loud? Who will bring me into the city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, which has cast us off? And thou, O God, which which thou not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly. For he is, it is that shall tread down our enemies. So notice here there is honest confession. Here we have David who is expanding the kingdom of Israel. He's bringing wealth to the entire nation. He's gaining more real estate for the nation of Israel. And he's leading uh, Israel to the very top of their prosperity and power. And it's likely that as he is experiencing all of this success, uh, all of these victories, that he is thinking that he is the cause for this success. And yet God in his wisdom, in order to keep David from destroying himself with pride, God allows the Edomites to come in and to challenge them so that God could once again demonstrate that it's God who is performing here. It's God who has given success to Israel, not David. So the, the success that David and the success that Israel has been enjoying is thanks to God, not thanks to the talents of David. Uh, it's not about David, but rather it's about God. And um, it's all about David needing God and his help. Notice that when there's confession on David's part, uh, this psalm that begins with a groan or with a moan or with a complaint, uh, uh, help me God because I'm in trouble. Uh, it, it is once again, one of those psalms that starts out with complaints and groans in a prayer, but it ends up in a shout of praise to God. All right, who's got a comment or a question or a takeaway from anything we just studied in Psalm chapter 60? Go ahead, Sylvia. Okay, so success tempts us to credit it to our own strength, our own talent, but it is the Lord who causes blessings, which always follow obedience, right, right Roger? <laughs> And, and the Edomites attacked southern Israel near Jerusalem. Joab led the troops to victory through a very hard-fought battle. And what went on with their battles typically reflected the health of their relationship with God. So if we need God to go to battle on our behalf, we need to draw near to him. We need to seek his intimacy. We need to trust him. Uh, to provide and protect us. Um, Israel's victories reflect the goodness of God and our promises that God kept to David because they had a close relationship. Now, was David perfect? No, not by any means. But what, what he was was a man after God's heart because when he started out down and low and in the pits and doing wrong and sinning, he ended up in praise and asking for forgiveness along the way. So um, that is a recipe for 
uh, getting help from God. I mean, we start off uh, in, in our lowly human existence and, and we end up reflecting our Lord and Savior. So God's promises are peace, provision, uh, his presence, his protection, just to name a few. Uh, but God is the God is the one performing. Our job is to trust because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So David typically he cries out to God at the beginning of these uh, studies, and by the end, uh, he he is dancing in praise. Yeah, good job. Who else has a comment about uh, Psalm chapter sixty? Anybody? Yeah, I think it's real important, a great lesson there that that we recognize that it's not us, it's not our talent, it's God's talent. And, you know, what Sylvia's talking about in these verses where God promises he's going to keep his promises, you know, if you were to add up the promises that we have in Scripture, they're in the tens of thousands of promises, and we can rely on all of those because God keeps his word. And all he expects of us is to keep our relationship together with him. And so we stay in relationship, we trust in God, and then God will, will protect us. Who else has a comment, a takeaway, anything about Psalm chapter 60? All right, go ahead, Carrie. Uh, I just want to say, Joab is very important to David in this army. And I mean, in this battle and in many battles, it was Joab who um, put Bathsheba's husband in front of the, to be slain in, in the battle. And it was Joab who uh, ended up killing David's general, I think it was Abner. And, and for that reason, uh, he did it on behalf of Saul, and he was angry because his brother had been killed. But in the end, it was also Joab whom on David's last days, he told um, his son he anointed to be king to, that, to take care of Joab because of, of the blood he had shed and that it was not to be against David and his family. So I find this interesting that Joab has such a presence of thinking of how it all ended up. And also all these battles, that to me, God is saying, these are mine. I, I, I won these battles, Gilead. And also, what does that mean? Moab is my wash pot. Uh, does that mean that he, he wasn't so, he did not like Moab? Or are the Philistines? Yeah, they were definitely enemies. Yeah, definitely enemies all along. Oh, but but that section of Psalm 60, uh, David was repeating the promises uh, that God had made to David that all of these enemies were going to be under his feet. So, uh, and I want to just mention, I think what Carrie brings up, it reminds me. If you were to do a good study of First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel, you're going to find a lot of these uh, historic events that took place, and you're going to find out all about the history of what happened um, uh, with David's involvement. But in those sections of the Bible, you don't find what David's emotions were, what his thoughts were, what his heart was. Uh, that's what he pours out to us uh, in in the book of Psalms, in his writings. Uh, he's experiencing all of these different historic events that he's living through. And you get the history, but you don't get his thoughts. You don't get his emotions. And that's what we get in the book of Psalms. So if you want to read the history around it, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel. Who else has a comment? Go ahead, Sheila. Carrie is right on, though, um, because when he's talking about Ephraim, um, and Ephraim was strength 
when he mentions the helmet for my head and Judah, my lawgiver, that's God's decree. That's actually messianic right there. Uh, Moab, David's enemy, the feet wash that, and they threw their shoes that that's uh, a low, low prestige place. So she's right. When he's talking, yeah, he's he's yeah, he's he's telling you what's what. Um, and they knew this. The the Jews would have known this. Um, and Edom is definitely the enemy. And overall, it's that God loves his people. He wants them in a covenantal relationship. God loves all people, but his people that are in covenant with him, except Yeshua as the Messiah, are protected by him. And that is so awesome. It makes us kingdom people. And um, so anyway, and the fear of the Lord, um, that is, is to change every aspect of our life. We're to fear the Lord, it's to change us um, for God's will and show it, it's, we should see it in our lives. Anyway. Yeah, so the fear uh, that I think you're speaking of, the fear of the Lord, uh, refers to a very healthy reverence for God and for his power. Um, and um, and uh, that's the beginning of, uh, of, of knowledge and wisdom when you, uh, when you submit your life to the Lord. So good job on that, Sheila, and good job, Carrie. Any other comments before we move on? Sylvia? One other thing that I think uh, we should remember when we're facing our battles in life is we should be counting our blessings and thanking God for them because then our, you know, we keep our, our eyes on how big God is and how powerful he is to save. Is his arm too short to handle our battles for us? No. And so the more we focus on him and rather than the battle before us, uh, the, the uh, well, it takes away the fear of man and gives us the respect for God. So that's where our strength lies. Good job. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. So in, in verse, I uh, just wanted to make a, in verse uh, three, it says, uh, you have given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. That word stagger, uh, if you look in the Septuagint, uh, it's the Greek word 2659. And Paul, it's only used one time in the New Testament. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what Paul's quoting. Uh, it's in caps in my translation. So he's quoting, and I'm not sure what he's quoting from. I think it's from uh, Isaiah 2910. But it says uh, in Romans 11.8, God gave them a spirit of stupor or staggering, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. So basically, David is saying that God has given them this wine to drink that makes them stagger. And Paul is saying that Israel has that same, still has that same spirit, even, even in the first century. Yeah, and so that would be also referred to as a veil over the eyes of. Uh, the nation of Israel who uh, rejected Jesus as the as the promised Messiah. Yeah. And that's why it's the Gentiles turn to receive salvation and, and engender jealousy in the Jews uh, for their relationship with God, which is going to draw them back. And then the national redemption of Israel will occur uh, when he returns. They'll recognize him for who he really is, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, promised one to Israel, and they will see it and repent, and they will receive him as their Lord and Messiah. So as we get into Psalm chapter 61, this is a, a favorite psalm for so many people through the centuries, many praise and worship songs have been written 
using this psalm as the lyrics. Uh, it is a psalm which has brought many people through serious storms of life. We don't know what was the situation that was going on in David's life during this period of time when he sat down and penned uh, this, this psalm. Um, and likely it was, it was intentional. Okay, we know that the Holy Spirit inspires all the writers of the Bible. Uh, so it's really, it's one author of many different scribes, uh, but it's likely intentional that David did not reveal in this writing what was going on in his life other than the fact that it was a very big storm of his life. And I think the reason why it's intentional is because, or why it was intentionally not revealed, all of our, all of us have challenges in life. But let's just say that, that David would have revealed a particular challenge when he wrote this psalm. It's very easy for human nature to say, well, you know, I wasn't attacked by the Philistines. I'm just using a, an arbitrary example. I haven't been attacked by the Philistines, so this really doesn't apply to me. That's human nature speaking. But a challenge is a challenge. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. And so likely the Holy Spirit had him reveal, not reveal what was going on in, in his life. Uh, so that we can all take this as a lesson as to what we're supposed to do when we receive a challenge in life. Uh, when we're overwhelmed, when we have a challenge in life, here are the instructions in Psalm chapter 61. Um, so uh, Howard, can I ask you to read just verse one to get us started? Psalm 61 and verse one. Hear my cry, O oh God, listen to my prayer. Yeah, so notice the very first thing that David is teaching us, that when you're overwhelmed, when you're challenged in life, what's the first thing to do? David goes to the Lord and he prays. And that is what you and I should be doing when we face those things in life that are larger than we are, we give it up to God in prayer. We cast all of our cares unto God because God is the one who cares. And this word cry that uh, Howard just read in verse one, uh, it has a meaning of screaming. It has a meaning of bellowing out. Help me, God. I'm going under. David gives himself unto prayer. Howard, would you read verse two, please? From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So when the pressure is upon you, what do people do? When they sense pressure in their lives, some people, they'll turn to eating. Some people will turn to alcohol. Some turn to drugs, some turn to shopping. Uh, human nature uses all kinds of things in order to seek comfort in our lives. And notice here that David uh, is asking for the grace to be led towards God. Uh, he's praying, God, I have come up against something which is bigger than me and I cannot handle it, and so please lead me back to you. That's what's going on here. And isn't that exactly what Jesus taught us uh, in, uh, when he was giving us instruction on how to pray? It, we refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we find that in Matthew chapter six. And so this is exactly what Jesus taught us Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. Sylvia? And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yes, yeah, so God, lead me. Lead me into your ways. Your, 
your will be done. Lead me into a place where I can survive this kind of a challenge. David goes on and he prays, and then he asks God to lead him and to guide him. All right, um, let's see. Um, Dan and Sheila, verses three through eight. Break it up however you'd like. And welcome, Dixie, from Utah. Glad Hi, you're here. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Selah. For you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will pro prolong the king's life. His years will be like generations. He will sit enthroned before God forever. Appoint faithfulness and truth that they may watch over him. So I will sing praise to your name forever that I may pay my vows day by day. So David prays. Then he asks God to lead him and guide him. And notice that David is throwing himself into his relationship with God. Notice the actions David is taking here. He says, I'm going to abide in your tabernacle. <clears throat> I'm going to do what I promised. I've made a vow to you, Lord. I've made a commitment to you, Lord. I've made a promise to you. What are those vows? What are those promises? What are those commitments? to follow the written word of God. He has made a vow to do that. And now he's restating, I will keep those vows and I'm going to sing praise unto you, Lord. There is a natural tendency. <clears throat> there's a natural tendency in our human nature that when we are deeply challenged, when we're deeply stressed, we have a tendency to withdraw from our relationship with God. We have a tendency to withdraw from our relationship with people. What David is saying here is, when I am overwhelmed, I am going to push myself harder and deeper into my relationship with God. I'm going to throw myself into my relationship with God. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to give more money to the to the church or the synagogue. I'm going to worship more. Uh, I'm going to allow God to handle my stress. I'm going to allow God to handle the challenges in my life. All right, who's got a comment, a question, or a takeaway on anything we studied just now in chapter 61 of Psalms? Arnie, you're next. So I like verse two where it says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He's talking about Jesus. He's, that's who he's saying, lead me to. Uh, everywhere that I've read in the Bible, when the word rock is used, it's fascinating how it always portrays strength. It always portrays goodness. I mean, <laughs> David killed Goliath with a rock. Moses struck a rock with his staff and water fed and gave to thousands. It's always, you know, something like that. I want to read two things for you with your permission. Sure. Uh, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And, in the, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the houses, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like foolish men who built his house on sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and, the, and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud 
and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Amen. Yeah, that's a great uh, a great uh, thought, great analogy between uh, uh, the strength of a rock and 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 what it represents in uh, in Christ. Good job, Arn. Who else has a comment, uh, question, or takeaway from uh, uh, Psalm sixty one? Sylvia. Okay, so all of our challenges of life may be addressed by these instructions. When you're overwhelmed, pray to God. We cast our cares on him because he cares for us and he is able to help us. So uh, here it, David is saying, help me Jesus or help me God. And uh, it reminded me of when Rob and I were driving back, we decided that it was too dangerous on the roads to drive to Tennessee, we'd already started and we were east of Hayesville on that mountain. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but we almost died on that mountain <laughs> because when we turned around to come home, uh, it was we were just skating on ice going down this steep mountain and we looked in the mirrors behind us was a semi truck, tractor truck, jackknifing at a very high rate of speed. Yeah, the tractor right behind the, us. the tractor was getting closer and closer, closer to us, but what he was hauling actually it turned, so he was straight behind us, but this, the rest of it turned and crossed over the the ongoing traffic lane and he was trying to speed up to pull the thing back and the more he sped up the closer he got to uh, to the what? back of our car <laughs> and we were going very slow because it was like it was like a sheet of ice. A sheet of ice yeah. And what did I say, Rob? Well, you started praying. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> you started I'm telling praying. You, yeah. you don't think about what to say. You just ask for help, you know. And, and, and I still don't know how we survived it. But we did because Jesus intervened. Yeah. So, so there's no there's no atheists in foxholes. I'll just say that. But also, we need to ask for the grace to be led back to God. Uh, and in Matthew 6, uh, 13, where Jesus gives us instructions how to pray, he is asking, he's telling us to ask God to lead, guide, and direct us. And <clears throat> that's how he teaches us to pray. So we need to abide with God, obey his uh, obey the vows and the promises and the commitments that we have made to keep the word and to sing praise to the Lord and to pray more and to yield to the Holy Spirit to allow him to handle our challenges on our behalf so that we can we can relax in him. You know, his yoke is light. His burden is easy. We just have to be able to rest in him. Good job. Any other comments on chapter 61? Uh, Go ahead, uh, Carrie Crawford. I just wanted to say that um, David is talking about hear my cry because above that, he says, give us help from trouble for vain is the help of man. So not only should we not depend on ourselves and think that we always have the answer and we can always work it out but neither should we put so much trust in our fellow man because they don't always have the answer either so we should always as sylvia said just automatically look to god uh, call out to god and then on the last verse i just want to say um david uh, again he went into praise and thanksgiving yeah, so one of the things that you're mentioning there, I think I think we're called to be um, an accountability for other believers. Uh, and it's not based upon our human nature or our own talents or, or our own intelligence, but you you can go to another man or woman who is a believer who has a very good understanding of the written word of God 
and let them give you counsel based upon the written word of God. I think that's the caveat to what you say, but definitely we are to rely on the Holy Spirit. Definitely we are to, to uh, pray to God when we have challenges in life. And so I want you to listen carefully because everybody on this call has challenges. Some of you have deeper challenges today than others, but we all have challenges. And what does it say? We are taught that we are not to withdraw, all right? You go all the way back to Genesis 2.19, um, and, and God says man should not be alone. That's why he gave Eve to Adam. So there's no lone rangers in your Christian walk, in your spiritual walk. And so whatever challenges that you're facing, your natural tendency would be to withdraw, not to talk to people, not to be around people, not to pray to God, not to develop your relationship with God. That's your human nature. But what we can get very clearly as leader, as, as, as guidance here in Psalm 61 is, is that's, not, that's not what God is teaching us to do, to withdraw but rather he's teaching us. The first thing you do is you, you go to the Lord in prayer. You let the Lord know, I can't handle this myself. I need your help. And then you rely on God, you praise God, and uh, you'll see that when you go to the Lord in prayer, prayer activates the throne of God. God will take action. It won't be in your time but you can trust it will come true in, in the perfect timing for God. So uh, this is a faith building exercise for those of you who you know, have medical issues or financial challenges, it doesn't matter. A challenge is a challenge. That's why the Holy Spirit didn't have David tell you what the challenge was so that you could say, well, no, I don't have the same challenge. A challenge is a challenge. Go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, build your relationship with God. That is where you need to go and let God handle the challenge. Any other comments before we move on to chapter 62? Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to continue building what Arnie was talking about earlier with the rock. Uh, in verse 2, it says, uh, uh, Psalm 61, verse 2, it says, From the end of the earth I, will, I, will, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is harder, higher than I. And that word rock you, uh, is, uh, uh, the Greek translation is uh, G4073, which is Petra. And Petra is used in Romans 933, uh, which says, uh, just as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a st stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. And that's quoting Isaiah from Isaiah chapter uh, 8. So I'm going to read verses 13 to 17. It is the Lord of armies whom you are to regard as holy, and he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. Then he will become a sanctuary, but to both the houses of Israel, he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them, then they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and caught. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait eager, eagerly for him. Good job. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Sylvia? Okay, so, Lord, I can't handle this alone. I need you as the best place to be to receive blessings from God. And we admit to the Lord that he is our strength, that he is so much stronger. He is better able to handle everything we face. He is full of mercy and grace to us when we are in that position of humility. Also, 
the rock of my salvation, to build on what Dan and Arn were saying is, uh, the rock of my salvation is the cornerstone as Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So that's the rock. And, and of course, the people that stumbled are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They stumbled over Jesus Christ as being Messiah. Yeah. And just to remind you, some of you uh, attended our <clears throat> study on the book of uh, Philippians in our home up in Hiawassee about three years ago. And uh, if you remember, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse uh, uh, Philippians 4.19, I think it is, uh, God provides for all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So if you had a need because you have a challenge, you need to go to the Lord. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so just to continue on that theme that with Sylvia, uh, so in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 to 18, he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So in verse 16, uh, Simon said, Peter answered, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 18, and I say to you that you are upon this rock, I will build my church. Yeah, and so uh, it's, a, it's a Bible study for a different day, but uh, those verses that Dan just read have been misinterpreted, especially by the Catholic Church, uh, where they uh, they say that they're referring to Peter as the rock, um, and I think uh, and I think that that's probably one of the reasons why he was named as the first pope. But the point is, the rock that's being referenced there. There's two different words for rock in those verses. One refers to Peter, but the rock that he's referring to there uh, that was accentuated uh, was the rock built on the church is is the uh, the Messiah. The cornerstone. The cornerstone, it's the Messiah. Um, okay, so Psalm 62, Psalm 62 is a Psalm which is filled with an incredible amount of instruction it is thought that this psalm was written by David during the time when David's son Absalom uh, rebelled against David. And many of these psalms uh, were written around, uh, many of David's psalms were written about around this episode uh, in David's life. And, and we have to remember that Absalom was a complete failure when it came to being a son. And yet we also have to remember that David failed miserably as a father to Absalom. And this was likely one of the most painful events in the life of David. You and I might experience uh, uh, some issues uh, with our kids when they were growing up. You know, we might have experienced where a kid is going to go stomping out of the room and uh, uh, slamming the door of their bedroom and yelling out, I hate you. Uh, but it's not likely that any of us have experienced where one of our child children uh, plotted to murder us. Uh, and that is the situation here that David is facing. Absalom has uh, uh, created a military coup and he is planning now to literally kill his father, David, in order to take over the throne. Uh, and Joyce, would you unmute, please, and read verses one and two, nice and loud. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. 
Yeah, so I wasn't planning on talking about this, but as I heard Joyce reading this, I can't help but think that if any of you were to read Hebrew or study Hebrew and go to this verse in the Hebrew Bible where it says, my salvation, you're going to see the Hebrew word that is the personal name for Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua. So uh, I, I, I don't like passing up the opportunity to share that, but if you read it in Hebrew where it says, my salvation, uh, it's going to say Yeshua, which is Jesus's personal name. We live in a culture where we have uh, a very self-assertive kind of gospel. God has become, um, uh, for many, uh, like a genie in a bottle. Uh, you pray the right prayer, you believe the right thing, and God is going to give you anything and everything that you want, uh, rather than God being the end of things. Our faith in God has become nothing more than an end to, to the means. Uh, I want to be prosperous. I want to be successful. I want to be happy. Uh, and God is just the guy who's going to get me there. And so we begin to assert ourselves. Uh, we assert our will. We assert our plan. And here David is, is saying, God, you are not a genie in a bottle. David is uh, uh, in this place of, of is in this place of of desperation. He says to God, "I need you to assert yourself." David is saying, "I need you, God, to assert yourself." And get this picture in your mind: David is fleeing the city of Jerusalem in the middle of the night. Likely, he has. Uh, a, a short list of close friends and family. And you have to understand that as he's fleeing with this very small group of people in fear of their lives, there are literally thousands of troops uh, who are hunting him down with the intent to brutally murder him. Uh, he is an elder man at this point of life. He's crying out to God. And David is saying, if I'm going to, if I am going to survive, the only reason for survival is because of God. In other words, I don't have a plan B. My only plan for survival is to rely on God. And if God, if you do not save me, I'm going to be dead. God is my only defense. God is my only hope. Okay, um, uh, Diane, would you read verses three and four? Unmute nice and loud. How long will you assault me? Would all, all, you, all of you throw me down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies with their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. And so you remember that Absalom was incredibly bitter towards David. Uh, he had no respect for his dad. Absalom is holding a grudge because David sat back and did not do anything. He did not kill this guy who, who uh, raped Absalom's sister. Uh, the guy flees from the country after he had he uh sorry absalom flees from uh israel after absalom administers justice to this guy and david was then manipulated by some people to allow absalom to come back into the, the nation of israel and even at that point david did not have any integrity uh to go and meet up with his son absalom until Someone else manipulated David uh, to go and see his son, but but now Absalom is plotting to kill his father. So you remember um, the uh, the history behind this. David uh, fell into a season of great sickness. Likely Absalom was hoping and wishing his dad would just die from whatever this illness was. But guess what? David did not die. 
He continued to live for a long period of time. And in fact, he got over the illness. And, uh, uh, and so finally, Absalom decides to take matters into his own hands. And now uh, notice how David repeats here, uh, there are lies uh, and that you can bless uh, with your mouth because uh, uh, they curse inwardly. Uh, but Absalom was a master manipulator. And there is no one in life who is more ugly, uh, more disgusting than a manipulator. Nothing hurts more than trusting someone. You think someone is your friend. Uh, you think that they're loyal to you. And then they turn around and they stab you in the back. One of the most horrible feelings we can have in our life. And Absalom was a master of manipulation. And he sucker punches David here. David did not see this one coming. All David knows is his security forces came to him and said, Absalom has declared himself the king. He's on his way over here to kill you. And you need to get out of town immediately or you will be dead. And, uh, and he got there by manipulation. Uh, Roger, would you read verses, unmute and read verses five and six, please. I wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I, where I will not be shaken. Yeah, so let's look closely here at what Roger just read in verses five and six, and let's go all the way back to verses one and two, and notice that these verses, five and six, are nearly identical to verses one and two. Notice both of them, uh, he says, I am going to wait on God. So when you and I say we're going to wait on God, that means that we are not going to do anything until God takes action or until God speaks and gives us direction. Um, when we face uh, big challenges in our lives uh, and we say, I'm going to wait on the Lord, then you must wait. Wait for God to speak or wait for God to show you some clear signs Wait for God to open some doors that can't be shut and shut doors that can't be open. It'll become very obvious to you. And until that happens, we are to wait because we know that if we launch our own, our own plan with our own strength uh, and our own wisdom, uh, we will only make the challenge worse. Notice that as David waits on God, what happens to his faith? His faith is strengthened. In verse two, he says, I'm going to be moved, but not greatly moved, moved a little bit. And then notice in verse six, he says, I'm going to be moved. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not going to be moved at all. You see his, his faith from, from verse two to verse six, his faith has increased. He was going to be moved a little, and now he's not going to be moved at all because he's back in conversation through prayer with God. Uh, you and I have this determination in our hearts that we're going to, to, to move uh, uh, until God speaks or until God moves. You're going to find that God is going to bless you. Because when you make that kind of commitment to God, God is going to bless you. And then your faith begins to grow. Um, let's see, Dixie, would you like to read? Sure. What would you like me to read? Uh, we're in uh, Psalm 62 verses seven and eight, please. Okay. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. Ye people pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Thank you. And again, I know uh, Sheila gets excited when I do this, but again, where it says in verse 7, my salvation, if you go to the Hebrew Bible, it's going to say Yeshua. 
Okay, that's Jesus's personal name. David now turns to, to the people and he tells them to do two things. Number one, trust in God. Number two, pour out your heart to God. <laughs> Those two things go together. Generally speaking, you do not pour out your heart to somebody unless you already trust them. You're not going to reveal all of your inward secrets to someone who you don't trust. But when there is someone in your life who you trust, you're just going to lay it all out before them. This is who I am. This is what I'm going. Well, this is what's going on in my life, uh, and this is what I need help with. So David says, you are to trust God, and you are to pour out your heart to God. And you can almost picture David doing this. It's, it's in the middle of the night. People are scared. Uh, what are we going to do, David? What, uh, are we going to die, David? Uh, how, how close are they, David? These are the people that are with him. And he turns to these people who are scared. They're scared for their own lives. And what does David say? You trust God. You pour out your, your heart out to God. He is, our, he is our God. He is our strength. He is our fortress. He is our refuge. He is the one who is going to take care of us. Um, Boyd, would you read verse 9, please? Unmute. Verse 9. Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, it is human nature for us to categorize other people. You know, if someone approaches you uh, and they're using poor grammar, maybe they're missing a few teeth, maybe they uh, they uh, have a, an unpleasant fragrance uh, odor, uh, and we label them maybe as a hillbilly or something because we have them uh, in one of our categories uh, of the people on a on a scale. And then someone else might approach us. They're well spoken. They're, they dress well. Uh, they drive a nice BMW, and we place them completely different category uh, on that scale. And then we, of course, place ourselves on the scale. Uh, and our human nature wants us to think that you know we're ambitious. We're moving up uh, in the world. We're climbing the ladder of social mobility. So. We're on a different level of that scale. What David is saying here, uh, which is, uh, Arnie, quite fascinating, that it doesn't matter. You can be the richest guy in the world. You can be the most powerful man in the world. Uh, you can place that on one side of the balance scale, and then you can have the poorest guy uh in the world who has no influence and put him on the other side of the scale and that scale is going to weigh out even both of them weigh less than nothing is what these verses say and how much uh how much is that when you weigh less than nothing david is saying that when man stands before god and please listen carefully here. When you stand before God, how much money you have in your checking account is not going to matter at all. How much influence you have in your culture does not matter at all. You remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. He then told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. God is not impressed with how much money you make. God is not impressed with how much money you have in the bank, because God is no respecter of persons. The only thing that God is interested in is how faithful 
that you are in those things that God has placed into your stewardship. And so that means that there is nobody here that is better than someone else. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We are all equal before God. Okay, uh, let's go back to uh, Boyd. You only read one verse. Would you read verses 10 through 12, nice and loud? Do not trust in oppression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. And loving kindness is thine, O Lord, for thou dost recompense a man according to his work. So notice what he is not saying. That becoming rich is a sin. That's not what he's saying. But rather he's simply saying that if your riches increase, do not set your heart on your riches. Do not become a worshiper of those things that God has blessed you with, but rather you become a worshiper to the one who has blessed you. David knows because God has spoken to him not just once, but rather twice, that all power belongs unto the Lord and all mercy belongs unto the Lord. And it is not true. Uh, is it not true that as a general rule, when you are overwhelmed, that you are uh, either in need of power of, or, or uh, e either in need of the power of God or you're in need of the mercy of God? <clears throat> when you become overwhelmed, there's only one of two things you need, the power of God or the mercy of God. God places these large challenges before us in each of our lives that we cannot overcome on our own, but rather we can only come overcome them through the strength, the power, and the mercy of God. We need the power of God to be released into our lives, or we need the mercy of God to be released in our lives. So David is saying, you need power. You need mercy, and those can only be found in God. And so when you become overwhelmed, no matter what's going on in your life right now, if you are overwhelmed, you need to turn to God in prayer. You need to ask God to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. And you must push deeper into your relationship with God, because God is our source of power. God is our source of mercy, and he will provide those things for us in our time of need if you'll just turn to him. Who's got a comment? Who's got a question? Takeaway from uh, chapter 62. Arnie, you're next. Two comments. The first one's pretty quick where it says wait in silence. You know, I don't think you're supposed to wait and do nothing. It's like a waiter waits on his customer. Uh, you should wait on the Lord. And it says, you know, his soul should wait. In other words, you should listen to the for the Lord. Don't just sit there, listen hard, really pay attention. Try to find out what the Lord is gonna, how the Lord is gonna guide you. The other, the other comment I have is, you know, David, he kind of builds a wall between him and his enemies by praising the Lord. I mean, and there's several negatives in this psalm, but the most fascinating thing I found in the psalm is that he praised the Lord 15 times in this one psalm. 15 times. He said uh, in verses 1, 2, 6, and 7, that it, the Lord is the source of his salvation or deliverance. In uh, verses 2, 6, and 7, he said, he is my rock. 
in two and six, he said he's my stability or I won't be shaken. Verse five, my hope. Verse seven, my glory. Verse seven and eight, my refuge. Verse 11, my power. And verse 12, the source of my steadfast love. 15 times he's praised the Lord and it shows David's faith in the Lord. That's what I think in this whole Psalm, that was what stood out. Good job, thank you, Arn. Who else has a comment or a question or a takeaway? Sylvia. Okay, so Absalom was David's son. I think it's fascinating that that Absalom, if you translate it, it's a compound Hebrew name, meaning Abba Shalom, father of peace. But he plotted a coup to take David's throne, that's C-O-U-P in the front, <laughs> by force. And David's only hope and defense was God. I mean, he's an he's an older man at this point in life. He is he is uh uh what's the term uh, vulnerable. So um, David said of his enemies, "With their mouths they bless, but inwardly they curse." Okay, so uh, you know, being a king. Uh, they're going to hear a lot of flattering words uh, in front of them, but uh, they don't know who to, who they can trust. But the bottom line is, is the hypocrisy and the vengeance came from Absalom, his only son. It must have been really, it really must have hit him in, in his heart. Uh, Absalom became a master manipulator to get his way around the the ruling and reigning father that he had. But uh, David waited on God. Uh, that's waiting to see how God is going to bless through adversity. He relied on God, his stronghold. Therefore, his faith was strengthened. Every time God carries you through adversity, pain a battle whatever it might be a, a diagnosis whatever it might be every time that we've gone through another diagnosis or another turn of events in rob's health for an example it has strengthened our faith we know that god is the source of healing we know that god made us and he, if he made us it's easy for him to heal us we need to trust in God and pour out our hearts to God, just as David did. God is our strength and our refuge, a mighty fortress in times of trouble. He's the one that says the ocean can only go so far and make it stick. <laughs> and how faithful we have been blessed uh, with, oh, oh, how faithful have we been with what God has entrusted to us to steward? We need to ask ourselves, what has God entrusted us to be steward over and how faithful have we been with it? Have we, you know, the, the parable of the talents, okay? Have we maximized the talents, the assets, the attributes that God has blessed us with or not? Have we sat on them? Uh, and that's going to be a really critical question as we reach, uh, you know, the end of our lives on earth. We we should not worship those things that God has blessed us with, but we need to worship the one true God that has given them. We all become overwhelmed with challenges. Um, And the, at those times, we need to seek the power of God and the mercy of God. He will provide as we seek him. Good job. I uh, just want to mention to you, while you're thinking about any other comments that you have, a couple of things. Um, uh, this week, uh, we have some uh, family in town uh, Thursday evening. So we changed our Bible study to Wednesday evening. 
Uh, I hope and pray you all can make it and choose to join us. We'll record it in case you cannot. It'll be Wednesday at 6.45. We'll be covering Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verses 22 to 33. Uh, and don't forget, next Monday night, we'll be covering verses, uh, sorry, um, uh, Psalm chapter uh, 63, 64, 65 and 66 next Monday night. Uh, also, uh, we are maybe a day away from having 67,000 views on our on our YouTube channel, most of which are Bible studies. People are watching you read Bible scripture and making comments and asking questions. And there are a lot of people who we don't get a chance to meet that are seeing those things. And if you're one of those people who is watching this as a video recording sometime out in the future and you have not given your life, your heart to Jesus Christ, uh, there's no coincidence that you're watching this video. God has placed you in front of this video. It's time to make a decision and it's best to make it right now. It's an eternal consequence if you do and if you don't, it's an eternal consequence. And uh, will you give your heart to Jesus? Will you accept him as your Lord and Savior? All you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and to very simply say a prayer out loud. And I'm going to ask Boyd to unmute and to say that prayer. You can use the pause button uh, in between each sentence and say it out loud yourself, start and stop. Uh, Boyd, what does that prayer sound like? Rob, it sounds like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. In your name, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 And uh, we congratulate you if you have said that prayer out loud and welcome you into God's family and encourage you to continue studying the written word of God. Who else has a comment, a question, or a takeaway from any uh, from Psalm 60, 61, or 62? Go ahead, Carrie. Wanted to speak on Absalom and David. Uh, I think it's a really sad situation because we think of Absalom as a really terrible son. However, when we read the story, um, you know, there's a verse that says, do not provoke, provoke not your children to wrath. <clears throat> what happened, I think what happens in families where there may be um, children from various mothers or various fathers or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, it all came about. I think Absalom in the beginning had a lot of respect for his dad. However, you know, we know the story of how uh, Tamar was raped by his brother, but they were, they were not blood brothers. And he told David about it and David did not handle it the way Absalom thought he should. And and it took him to and Absalom waited for two years for something to be done about it. And when it wasn't, um, he made a move to kill that brother and then he had to leave. Well, David and and you say, well, why didn't David do something about it? Well, for that to happen in a family, and this is the palace, the king's family. I don't I don't know how David handled or what he actually did, but it was a it was a thing that you don't even talk about in the family. And we know Leviticus 33, that was one of the rules, eight things that you never did. So because of how all that was handled, that brought all the angst of Absalom and his dad. He left and he, uh, because he knew that he was in trouble. I, well, that was. And then in the end, he ended up dying because <laughs> Really, it was Joab who really killed him, but David did not want him killed. 
David did not really want him to die because of um, it, he didn't, but he ended up um, dying because of Joab actually killed him. You know, he may have lived from his hair hanging from the tree, but it was I think it was Joab that killed Absalom. But anyway, it's kind of a sad story, but about it's really about a family matter and that greatly grieved David. <clears throat> But David had been forewarned that these things were going to happen in his family. Also, I wanted to ask a question about verse 11 in Psalm 62. It says, all power belongs to God and also all mercy. So I just wanted maybe someone to comment on uh, during Acts 2 when it says uh, he was talking to his disciples and he said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. So um, it is not that the power that the disciples received or those who received it from the Pentecost that, oh, you have power on your own. That power still belongs to God. Yeah, so all right, yeah, interesting question. Uh, uh, which would bring us into the topic or the discussion of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pentecost, whenever you hear the term Pentecost or the Feast of Pentecost, uh, you have to immediately think about the delivering of the Holy Spirit. And the reference there was uh, that you will receive power. Uh, that would uh, be a reference then to the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is really uh, part of the triune God, just as uh, the, the power that's referenced here uh, in God uh, in Psalm chapter 62. Uh, you know, the power, the power of God is, the, is also the power of the Father, it's also the power of the Son, it's also power of the Holy Spirit that indwells. Arnie, oh wait, before Arnie, um, I just want to make one more comment because uh, I, you all have heard me say this, but we don't know who's listening. And I want to just make sure, uh, not a criticism by any means to carry, but when the, the word story is used referencing Bible uh, scripture, uh, I cringe just a little, and you don't have to change what you say, Carrie. I'm just making a clarification here. Uh, sometimes when people hear the term story, uh, it could be interpreted as fiction or fable. When in fact, the things that are recorded in the Bible are, are verified historic events. And so, it's not a criticism, but it's just a clarification that what, go, what, what is written about in scripture is not a fable, it's not fiction. Uh, and when you hear the term story, don't misunderstand it because it is in fact verified over 25,000 times by archeologists. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, these are historic, events. Arnie, go ahead. And I just want to follow up on what Carrie just said. You know, we all have that power that the disciples have if our faith is strong enough. I mean, remember Peter stepped out of the boat and tried to walk on water and Jesus and he started to go down and Jesus said, you don't have a strong enough faith. If you had faith strong enough, you could move these mountains. And I believe that we all have that power through the Holy Spirit if our faith is strong enough. If our faith is not strong enough, of course, we can't move a mountain, but we could move a table. Um, I just, you know, that's all I wanted to say. Good job. Thank and I you. think faith is built through going through the tough times of life. Uh, it's strengthened every time you see God carrying you through these challenges, these trials and tribulations of life. And you come out on the other side and you look back and go, wow, God used that to bless us in a big way. You know, for example, when Rob was in the hospital with a fever of 105 about a year and a half ago, 
I mean, we thought that was unto death. We were, you know, it was, it, it was scary. But I will say that as our faith rose up and everybody started to pray, it went from, is he going to survive the day to, at the end of the day, they showed me the numbers and it's like, there's nothing wrong with him tonight. So when you see God act in measurable ways and miraculous ways, your faith will be built. So, you know, d don't resist the, the trials and tribulations of this life. God's going to carry you through if you trust him for it. Good job. Um, he, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move that mountain. You know, yeah, exactly. That's right. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, for y'all to think for a minute or two. I'd like two people to volunteer to step up and volunteer to close us in a prayer. I would like to thank each and every one of you uh, for your faithful attendance. It is, in fact, the very thing that is encouraging, uh, that, that uh, helps us to continue uh, working and studying and pre preparing uh, these Bible studies for you. Uh, we are honored and blessed to be part of this group. Uh, we we love each and every one of you and appreciate you, and we're so grateful to have you as part of our extended family. And we pray for you. And uh, learn a, an awful lot from you as well. I hope you learn a lot from these Bible studies. Uh, Boyd uh, Boyd has uh, been with us the longest, uh, all the way back to 2004 five or six, six. and uh, we've learned an awful lot from Boyd and and, uh, and then we, Howard and uh, Howard yeah, been but, with us uh, since 2014 but we sure appreciate your your faithful attendance and we mm -hmm. are we are certainly blessed to be a part of this group mm -hmm. uh, who would like to uh, volunteer to close us in a prayer remember blessing uh, always follows obedience um arnie is uh one of two and who else who would else like else? to uh, close us in a prayer dan is two of two okay, okay. so uh, uh very good so uh hope to see uh can i get a little show of hands who who might be available wednesday rather than coming here thursday <laughs> Um, I, One, two, three, four. Well, we're going to do it, well, even if it was just the two of us, yeah, but we're happy that you all are going <laughs> to be here and we will, uh, it'll just be for this week because uh, we have family in town yeah. on Thursday night uh, and we'll resume back to Thursdays the following week. So we'll certainly send you a, um, <clears throat> uh, we'll send you a, uh, a recording of it. All right, uh, Arnie, why don't you start us off with a closing prayer, and then, Dan, you can finish us with a closing prayer. Lord, hear this prayer. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you for bringing Rob and Sylvia into all our lives so that we can hear and read and try to understand more of your word. We hope that everybody leaves this Bible study tonight with a little bit more wisdom than they had before it started. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, Exodus 15. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Uh, tonight we were reading that uh, uh, the rock, uh, as Arnie said, all the all the uh, uh, different praises that David uh, uh, bestowed us. Uh, uh, God is to be highly exalted. Uh, we are to subject ourselves, uh, submit to His will, uh, and the more we submit, the more He will reveal. So I just pray that we have uh, ears to hear and eyes to see, and that He would. Uh, 
uh, put uh, they pour the Holy Spirit into us so that we could uh, uh, do His will. In uh, Yeshua's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.